Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Today is just like, honestly, the kind of conversation that I love to have. It's smart, it's spiritual, it's psychedelic, it's extraterrestrial, and it's all brought to you by a highly accomplished, brilliant doctor. Dr. Trevor Berry is a board certified chiropractic neurologist. And he said, I said, how do you want to be introduced? And he said, a resident psychonaut. <laughs> so really just saying that we just get into these spaces that are a little different. They're not just classic science. They're not classic neurology. Um, and so uh, just to explain a little bit more, he uh, has been an international speaker since 2010. He lectures on brain injuries, neurodegeneration, nutrition, and functional medicine, laboratory testing, neurological diagnostic testing, functional neurology, and low level laser therapy. So anyway, basically he's done so much research in the field of the brain and the body and inflammation. He tells the story at the very beginning about why he got into it, which has to do with his daughter. He's come across these lasers that are a cool laser. They're a low laser, like a perfect bandwidth to be able to use on a regular basis, as well as have no negative reaction. So um, I worked with him last year to help with what was diagnosed as post-concussional syndrome. So I did 12 sessions in the course of of four weeks so I went a couple of times a week and just had such incredible biomarker feedback improving from the very beginning to the very end but he talks tons about the lasers what they do what creates good brain health what helps with longevity with with not aging and then we got into psychedelics which he is a big proponent of and has tested them all himself and has amazing stories from as well as then his trip to Egypt and consciousness and fractals and the universe and what is reality and uh, I love these conversations so I hope you love it as much as I did uh, please let me know what you think in the feedback I'd love to I'd love to hear what your thoughts are and um, please hit subscribe I really appreciate all the subscriptions it tells me that you guys really enjoy what's going on on the screen and please hit the bell for notifications I, I totally thought you were going to give me a definition of Penrose's quantum consciousness theory. <laughs> if that was plausible, because people don't even know how to define consciousness yet, then then I might consider it. But <laughs> so if you the cliff notes is is when you look at the microtubules, um, it you know the the theory is stating that to, for that to have that little mini computer inside a neuron there has to be a fractal pattern. And so the theory is that that fractal pattern, those electrons bouncing around are with our are, are stage within that microtubule, which is actually the scaffolding of the neuron of the brain. And so that scaffolding, that by itself is a fractal pattern. Like when a cell divides, that's actually a fractal pattern that is made as that skeleton pulls the cell and divides it into two. Well, can, that's also the transport system that is made between the two. So like if neuron A is talking to neuron B, it's the microtubules that communicate and send those growth factors and the neurotransmitters and all that down the tubule. Well, that's actually where they believe the fractal is containing that little mini quantum computer. And of course, like, you know, the way that the neurons in the brain fire looks like the fabric of the universe and how information passes. So look, like I'm kind of obsessed with fractals and quantum entanglement. Uh, I find that a very fascinating topic as well. Um, so we're going to let that be like a cliffhanger for people to keep listening. So uh, we can talk about some, how we met and the work we did together. Uh, and then we can get into fractals and microtubules and um, consciousness and Egypt, because you went to Egypt last year. And of course, I went to Egypt the year before. So, you know, um, there's a lot to a lot to um, have fun with playing in those, uh, you know, spaces of conversation. But first and foremost, I met you for brain health. So maybe go. I think it's actually like I loved you telling the story about how you got into lasers, how you got into um, why you got into them and your motivation, because I think there's such authenticity in the reason why you became really obsessed and determined to figure out what created the, the, the healthiest brain, the least inflammation in the brain and body. So, um, so please, if you're willing to share. Yeah, my why definitely stems from my my ex-wife and I have two daughters and she has unfortunately has a severe familial predilection for Alzheimer's. Um, and, you know, as my daughters had to witness this in their upbringing about those, you know, that that family decline, 
Um, you know, I was really worried, obviously, with that genetic predilection, everything I could do to protect those two, especially after they had to witness like their grandmother go through it, things like that. They said, you know, their, their big thing was, you know, the tears in their eyes like, Daddy, this isn't going to happen to us, is it? And I, I vowed to them, as long as I'm on this planet breathing, I'm going to do everything I can in research and clinical applications to protect those two. You know, and so that's that's why you know, the laser thing was so important to me, because I'm, I was trying to find ways that that were efficacious. You know, the, the literature was there. And but you know, when it, when it comes to neurodegeneration like Alzheimer's, it's such a multifactorial thing that you have to address. There's not one smoking gun when it comes to neurodegeneration. There, you have to address, like as you alluded to, brain inflammation, autoimmunity, barrier systems, mitochondria and energy. You know, the, the list just goes on and on. So you start looking at, well, how do I check off those boxes? And what's interesting about low level laser therapy is that when you look, it's almost too good to be true, because when you look at all the major, major physiological changes, that you need to protect the brain, low level laser can actually produce all of them. It can facilitate energy. It can actually even promote new nerve generation or neurogenesis in the brain, new mitochondrial formation for energy production. And as we get more into the microtubule thing, if you look at when the brains go down the, the hill, you know, everyone's focusing on amyloid right now, that plaque that gunk on the outside of a neuron. And there's some relevance to that, but the newer research shows that actually it may even be a neuroprotective thing. There are times when it's bad, like when we have too much sugar in our diet and our Western, you know, all, all the carb loading that we do, that tends to gunk up the outside of the neurons. That's why a lot of researchers call it uh, Alzheimer's type three, uh, you know, type three diabetes is, a, is actually a term that's sometimes used. So hmm. sugar causes, that's one of the mechanisms that causes that to gunk up. But what we want to look at is actually what are these what are called protein misfolds. And so that scaffolding of the microtubules, that communication network, that beautiful architecture inside the cell, that's held together by these tau proteins. And when those proteins misfold, that, the, that whole architecture falls apart and the neuron dies. What so, causes the architectural to fold? So if those proteins are misfolded, uh, basically what happens is it's, it's like, there's a couple of models there. One is, one is a toxin and inflammation model. So you can look at it from that perspective. You know, you went through a lot of autoimmune stuff last year and you were gracious to share like your explant stuff. When we look at the immune system, when it gets ticked off, that's one thing that can be a precursor for that. Another big one is excitotoxicity. When too much calcium and too much glutamate is in the, going into the neuron, it can cause proteins to misfold. So this is why we don't want to do like diet products, for example, and things of that nature. What does that um, mean, diet well, products? Well, di like diet soda, for example, oh. and low calorie stuff. If you want to whack a neuron, go ahead and, and, and drink a diet soda kind of thing. Because you, it's like a Goldilocks effect. You need the right amount of calcium to come into a neuron to activate the system. But if too much calcium comes in, it actually causes this whole cascade of free radical damage and, and the, all these things that cause the, the proteins to, to become, uh, you know, when you look at transcription, like when the proteins are replicating, it causes that to become faulty. So that, that beautiful Golden Gate Bridge that is your microtubules, it's like being put together with faulty cement. And mm -hmm. when it collapses, it, you know, the neuron goes bye bye. Well, those lasers actually not only protect that concrete to make sure those tau uh, proteins are healthy, it can actually reverse damage protein. So oh, they're wow. actually showing, yeah, with low level lasers, they're actually showing reversal of those plaques and reversal of tau protein buildup. So those are two big players in the field of neurodegeneration. Does that include when you talk about like diet, diet products, does that include all the other more, um, the newer sweeteners, stevia and erythrol and those kinds of sweeteners as well? I'm okay with like an organic stevia for or example. monk fruit. Or That's yeah. Monk fruit. I'm good with organic honey, you know, things like I'm, I'm good with that. It's the artificial stuff and all the derivatives of it. And, and, you know, even like monosodium glutamate is another one. You hear about glutamate talk, excitotoxicity. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, we got to watch for things. Like I love when you post on your social media that you eat good, organic, healthy, you know, lots of good fish, good meat, good vegetables, that kind of stuff. That's what we need our diets to be based around to have a healthy brain and prevent neurodegeneration. Yeah. A lot of a lot of dementia is based on Western, you know, Western hmm. tendencies of what we tend to consume here in, in our society. So 
How does the, how do the cold laser, I want you to talk about the lasers because I know that, you know, you've searched for a long time for the right lasers and the Arconia lasers are what the best are because they're a cool laser versus a, a, a hot laser. But before we explain that, so people understand what we're talking about and, and why I came in to see you in the work we did, um, does that also affect the telomeres? Like what role do the, do telomeres have on top of everything else that you were just talking about? Because telomeres, I understand, have to do with aging and um, those shorten over time too. And yeah, that's that what causes bio- aging. Exactly. That biological aging process is definitely tied in. Uh, telomere shortening is, is definitely a um, process that the lasers have been shown to protect that. And, and the mechanism that's been seen is there's a, uh, if you look at the, like the master uh, antioxidant, anti-aging system, it's called NRF2, NRF2. Mm-hmm. And lasers, especially that red one that you have, that 635 yeah. nanometer has been shown to activate NRF2. And that will prevent uh, or that will help uh, mitigate the aging and the damaging process on our DNA sequences. Uh-huh. Um, a food analogous to that, that would be the glucoraphanins or sulforaphanes that are heavy in broccoli. One of the superfoods is broccoli for a reason. Um, that's your highest source of, of uh, glucoraphanins and sulforaphanes. So lasers will emulate that process with that antioxidant, free radical, anti-aging kind of uh, protection. So that's one of the first benefits of your laser is when you look at glutathione, superoxide dismutase, catalase, all those big ones that are the mother of all antioxidants, lasers promote those systems for you. Just like mm-hmm. eating blueberries, to, you know, and those kind of things. So lasers do that antioxidant. I know you mentioned in in one of your, I think it was your final podcast, you love glutathione and NAC, and for good reason. NAC is one of the super nutrients we're using in long COVID and micro mold stuff. We're using across the board. We're using NAC. Well, lasers do all that antioxidant stuff for you. Brain inflammation is one of the biggest things that we have to tamp down. If you just because you have a genetic predilection for something doesn't mean it has to manifest. We all have problems in our gene SNPs, you know, in our DNA sequence, sure. but it doesn't mean it has to become a disease or actually manifest to you at creating an illness. Well, when you look at the number one epigenetic tripwire, like what are we doing to ourselves that actually would push you off that cliff if you were predisposed, like APOE4, for example, it's brain inflammation. And brain inflammation, it comes from many sources. Obviously, our diet's one of them. Head trauma, which we're about to get into with traumatic brain injury and post-concussion mm-hmm. syndrome. Um, pathogens, viruses in the brain, bacteria cause it, those kind of things. So our number one job is to tamp down inflammation. And so when you look at all of the cascades of inflammation, the linchpin being what's called nuclear factor kappa beta, and it just don't worry about these terms. It's just that the inflammation, it's its your immune system's attempt to protect you. So we need inflammation in the short term. You just don't want chronic inflammation. None of us right. want chronic inflammation. And so one of the problems with CTE and post-concussion syndrome and whatnot is that the inflammation cascade doesn't get turned off. Your brain stays ticked off. So you stay in like flight, essentially. Yeah. Fight or flight, you know, you're like in fight or flight all the time. It never down regulates. And the cascade effect of that is brain inflammation. What else? So brain inflammation will cause things like that. That will lead to um, changes in the, in when you look at the neurons and how they operate, it's there, there's the primary neuron, right? But you have all these supporting neurons. They're called your glial cells and they make up your blood brain barrier. They make up um, Mm -hmm. the pruning of the bonsai tree. That is your brain. They make up the new, like the, the the immune part of your brain. They just found a new layer in your skull, in your meninges, by the way. It's called the slime layer. And that's where all those immune cells hang out. They couldn't come up with a better name than slime layer. Exactly. <laughs> Subarachnoid lymph lymph layer. So what, what lasers do is they actually promote healthy neuronal and immune responses. So you need to send out the attack or the SWAT team, right? To, f- to fight, like defend you. Say you're under attack by a virus or a bacteria, but you have to turn that off. And I use the analogy when I lecture and I teach, it's like your those glial cells, like your microglia are like the Bruce Banner of your brain. They're these super sharp scientists by day. But if you punch Bruce Banner in the head, he turns into the Hulk, right? And Hulk smash. And now Hulk's protecting you, but you also see what he's doing to the city, the cars, the streets. Like it's it's tumbling down. Well, that cortical atrophy, that that those buildings coming down, that in essence is the same thing that's happening in Alzheimer's 
and in CTE or post con like chronic post concussion cases, you start to see cortical atrophy. So what we have to do is find ways for the Hulk to turn back into Bruce Banner. And they literally just came up with a study last week that shows those glial cells or last month, sorry, that they shape shift. They actually, you know, I kind of use it as a funny analogy, but it turns out those glial cells shape shift like the, the, the Hulk does to protect you. And so they, and laser studies have been shown to turn the Hulk back into that super sharp scientist, Bruce Banner, to go back to you know, all the other important tasks that it does. So lasers will do that. Um, some nutrients to do that are like omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil is really good to turn, you know, those, those pro resolving meters. Turmeric is a big one that does that as well too. And again, your glutathione and N-acetylcysteine, there we go again. So those are just some ways to tamp down inflammation and get the Hulk to calm down. I mentioned in that sentence, the blood brain barrier, our barrier systems, you know, that's, you have like single cell layers in your gut and, and then in your brain, you have just these astrocytes protecting you from the outside world. And so if you get disruption in blood, brain barrier and gut barrier, then you have to repair it. You got to put it back together. Otherwise, bad stuff gets in there, like metals, like viruses, those kind of things. Well, studies have been shown that lasers will protect not only your gut barrier, repair your gut barrier, but also your blood brain barrier. So huh. that's another layer of protection that's big in the grand scale of things. So how does, because one of the things that I did, and we're totally going to get to these lasers eventually and what exactly they are, but the one of the things that I did in part of my protocol, because uh, for people that listen to me a lot would know that I had heavy metal toxicity. Um, turns out I have mold to some degree too, a few different strains, but w the one in particular was for heavy metals and especially mercury, mercury gets into the brain and crosses the blood brain barrier. So one of my moda one of my, um, supplements that I was using was a certain, um, tincture that I in just put in my mouth that, uh, crossed the blood brain barrier to detox. So how does, if like, how does it get in? Are there just certain substances that cross the br blood brain barrier, no matter how strong it is? Yeah, there's that element. Usually there are certain things that will punch their own hole, like a Trojan horse mm. through the blood brain barrier. And so, yes, yeah, certain metals will actually create their own disruption in the barrier systems. Huh. Free radicals um, and, and, you know, advanced glycan end products like homocysteine when we don't have proper B vitamins and things like that will do it. Gluten can actually do it like wheat germ and gluten and things like that can actually punch tickets. Like here's a good example. Some of the, the, the research that goes into um, brain cancers, one of the ways they were trying to get the cancer drugs into the brain was using the gluten to actually punch a hole in there to get it in there. It's not the <laughs> primary method, that, but it just kind of, you know, illustrates, sure. you know, how that can do it. So, yeah, but even in um, a traumatic brain injury, we're seeing within four to six hours of, of every TBI that you're developing leaky brain and leaky gut. As TBI, a matter of sorry, what's that? Leaky brain and leaky every, gut. With every TBI, did you uh, say? I'm sorry, traumatic, traumatic brain, brain injury. Traumatic brain injury. Okay, so when you have a traumatic brain, like, so say, um, you know, unfortunately, say we have a crash in a car or something, right? Away, yeah. <laughs> so right away, not you didn't ever have any of those, but when they do happen, it is something that you, you the barriers open up. And one of the markers that we use is called GFAP, but that means that the proteins of the brain got into the bloodstream and mm. they shouldn't be in there. Your brain should be like a king and queen on a castle behind the moat, behind you know the castle wall, that kind of thing. So if you're seeing proteins out in the bloodstream from the brain, that's not a good sign. So that if stuff can go out, that means stuff is going in like mold, like uh, like heavy metals and that kind of stuff. So then you have to draw those out. Like you were talking about, we use fulvic acid, humic acid. There's different things can draw that stuff out right. uh, to get it out of there, which is some of the stuff you did. And then lasers come in and tamp out that inflammation that it created and seal that barrier to protect it again. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the lasers and what makes Arconia lasers different than the other ones that you have um, researched. Yeah. So that, that, you know, when, when you start putting all these pieces together, it's not like, oh, is this too good to be true? It checks off like 50 boxes that you need for your brain. There is the catch though. The one, the main caveat that you see in research is that there's a, a Goldilocks effect of dose and energy and wave and wavelength activity. And what that means is, is light sources have certain power. It has certain wavelength, that kind of stuff. And what all the literature shows is that you don't want to exceed 10 joules per centimeter squared to the brain. I know that's going to sound Greek to most people, but it's just, you don't need, you know, less is more when it comes to laser. There's paper after paper in immunology, in brain, in cancer studies 
with laser not exceeding that threshold. If you can stay below that, then away you go. And that's your safe zone to stay in. So this laser right here is perfectly situated to stay in the low end of the dose response that's safe to use on the brain. A good example on the other, the far end of the power spectrum is that, you know, surgical lasers that are super high powered, they're designed to zap tissue, like ablate oh. tissue and that kind of stuff. Obviously, we're not trying to do that to the brain. Right therapeutically. So the low level laser that's below 10 joules per centimeter squared or what's called 10 electron volts, that is your perfect sweet spot. So Erconia does that. So my first job as a physician, especially on my daughter's head, is to do no harm. So that's why I'm not going to do a high power device on anyone's head. Those devices, when you look at infrared and near infrared, like we, a lot of us will do infrared saunas and stuff, right? Those yeah. are longer wavelengths that heat up water molecules to cook it. That's what a microwave is. Well, I'm yeah. not going to stick my head in a microwave. And I, so I definitely don't want to, you know, do any high powered stuff on that far end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is LED. So what that is, is you'll see these like inexpensive devices that are on Amazon and stuff like laser. They call them laser pointers. They're not laser. Those are just scattered photons of energy. And so what we like, that's, they're, they're a lot less expensive because it takes a lot of money and engineering to get all those photons of energy working together in the exact same direction, collimated, mm -hmm. all working together to get better outcomes. So just to give you an example on the LED end of the spectrum, we use it as our sham placebo when we do laser studies. So we'll compare Araconia to an LED because we, we do double blind studies on all these yeah. devices. As a matter of fact, Further to that, Erconia, when you look at FDA clearances, Erconia has 20 of the 24 FDA clearances. They have more FDA coverage than any all the laser companies combined. So, And we've never had a side effect reported in any of the FDA studies. You show wow. me anything, yeah, any study that has that. So, wow. so you want to be somewhere in between, high-powered and LED. Well, the true laser that's right in between is Erconia. They nailed it, and that's why I attached my cart to their horse. Mm, mm. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, does that mean that you can use it every day kind of thing too? Is that when it's not, uh, when it has no negative effect on the brain because of the bandwidth that it's using, does that also mean that you can use it all the time? Is there an overdose that you can go have of the laser? It, in theory, it could be, but you'd have to do lasers for 14 hours with your conia to exceed dose. So you're pretty safe on that front. Most people aren't going to do a 14 hour treatment. Um, you know, so I would look at it from in short. Yes, you can. Do, I do. I do it every day. Uh, my whole office staff is under lasers every day at lunch. It's kind of funny when you see us like this is my uh, my FX 405 right behind me here. Uh, one of the ways you can actually um, regrow neurons in your brain is lasering it. And so what I do, there's also, you may have read the studies with uh, meditation. Meditation mm -hmm. actually promotes new neural pathways, especially in the hippocampus, yeah. that memory yep. center yeah. where, where yeah. dementia starts. So if you want to yep. do a one-two punch to really help with your hippocampus and gray matter, meditate while yeah. doing it. Exactly. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. So I do it all the time. Now, I used to not even be able to meditate on my brain. I was working way on high beta and too much stuff. So it was actually ayahuasca that actually taught me how to do meditation stuff. Oh, my like, God. We'll, we'll get into that later, hopefully. Totally. But yeah. So, so, but meditation is really good. You know, sitting under the laser while you do memory recall stuff is good. Sitting under the laser doing happy thoughts for depression, like default mm -hmm. mode network work is phenomenal for that. They, they've done lots of laser studies wow. on depression. So is it just perpetuating? Is it just a momentum? Like, because, you know, you and I can get really into the woo woo space of energy and quantum physics and all of that stuff. But, but based on what you're saying in the studies, does that mean, is this, does it, um, uh, heighten or exacerbate momentum essentially? Yeah. So when you look at all the, the when when neurons are trying to connect and make new pathways and stuff the main thing they need is energy uh -huh. and it goes back to that mitochondria thing i know you had dave asprey who's like the mitochondria yeah. guru right like yeah. bulletproof caught all that stuff i love yeah. that stuff. mitochondria is the powerhouse it actually has its own dna mm -hmm. so it's not just your nuclear dna mitochondria has its own dna you know where we get that dna from our moms our mothers pass on my, we're the, you guys are the powerhouse, right? Mom, moms are the powerhouse. They're the ones that, that create the energy for that. And 
What we've just found in recent studies is that each different color of wavelength actually protects different parts of the mitochondria. So that's why like you have red, which is the rate limiting enzyme and violet, which protects the first two complexes. And then this is that new one. This is the green violet one. Mm -hmm. And we just found out green is the one that actually protects the third complex. And now we've got the whole mitochondria covered. So now you have these, these great energy producing things so that your brain can work all of its magic, make new connections, make you know memories, make all these things and grow pathways. But then you want to activate the brain at the same time or yeah. sometimes thereafter. So that's yeah. like when we did a lot of your therapies, we would not only do laser passively as an anti-inflammatory, anti um, you know, free radical, all these good things that it does. But we would even like while you were doing some of those complex brain exercises that we did with you, we would laser your brain at the same time. And so that just to gives promote you the momentum of improving those uh, those um, that those patterns or those um, those, uh, you know, uh, systems in my brain that are trying to be able to pick the dots up quicker to be able to track more accurately with my eyes and gaze stabilize. So we were promoting more of what I was trying to do. That makes that that that's fantastic. Exactly. Um, that okay, so what what did I so I came in, and we did a baseline evaluation. And what the hell did you find? <laughs> well, so one of the things doctors got to get back to doing is being doctors. Like we, <laughs> we become just, oh, you got this. Let's run this test and see what comes back. Or here, let's give you this prescription and see if that that mitigates those symptoms. But when it comes to neurology, you have to take an integrative approach, right? You have to understand hormones and thyroid function and adrenal function and all these things that affect the brain, the heart. So we did a full cardiac workup on you, like heart rate variability testing and bilateral blood pressure and all that. And then we assessed the entire brain. You remember how long I, you know, I, I spent on average between 45 minutes and an hour just doing my, my initial bedside neuro workup because I'm looking at the different parts, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the visual system, the auditory system, the cerebellum. So we, we assess all that. And then when I put it all together and paint that whole picture of what your body's doing, my job as an integrative neurologist is to take those weak links in your in your system and do stuff to stimulate them. Now, whether I stimulate it with direct laser application, like like your left cerebellum, for example, or if I um, do it with nutrients or some sort of other thyroid support, you know, whatever it takes. You have to be able to have a multimodal approach because I'll line up 10 Alzheimer's patients and I'll have 10 different treatment plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are certain common denominators, but there's individual underpinnings to each. You know, some of my Alzheimer's patients is because of virus. Some of them, it's because of an anemia pattern, like they don't have iron or B vitamins or whatever, or, you know, or some combination of all of the above. So what we did was we assessed your entire ner nervous system to see where those weaknesses were. And then we prescribed certain exercises and laser protocols and stuff to activate those areas. Because if you've got a weak bicep, what do you do to make it stronger? You do bicep curls, right? Right. Well, yeah, if I've got a weak right cerebellum, you know, the, the little brain there that coordinates all your muscle activity, you know, what are you going to do to make that stronger? Or if I have a weak left frontal lobe, what, so we prescribe exercises to target and activate those weak areas of the brain. Okay. And so that's what, what did I did. have? Yeah. And that's so what did I have? What, what, what was the, what was my, what was my um, condition? And then like, what was it that we broke it down into to fix it? Well, you did have some of the Hulk smash stuff going on. And one of the, the other things that we do with that is um, to tamp down inflammation and protect the barriers is we did a lot of vagal nerve stimulation with you. Mm. Explain so that. Explain the vagal nerve because I don't, maybe a lot of people don't understand it and, yeah. you know, maybe I don't completely understand it. So go ahead. Yeah. So you've got, um, when you hear about the brain gut axis, you know, we're a, there's a pretty important communication that goes from your brain to your digestive system and your gut microbiome, like all the good bugs in your in your gut. Hopefully they're good, not bad ones. And that, those good bacteria and what your gut's doing has a direct highway to the brain. It's called the vagus nerve. And so there's an output of the vagus nerve, but there's even more input that goes from the gut to the brain. Mm -hmm. And then you even have the polyvagal theory, which you've probably read about, like love and connection and like i won't go too deep down that rabbit hole but like when you have intuition for example yeah. The, yeah. you know that's tied into the polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve and so what we did was directly activate that 
to help inflammation, to help that brain gut communication and, and help the barrier systems with you. And then you did have some frontal lobe slowing, you know, so um, some of your working memory, like one of the things you would talk to me about was when you were interviewing people and whatnot, you would have a thought and you wanted to say, come back to that. But as they were talking, you know, it was like, okay, maybe I've lost a little bit of that. So we did some stuff with that connection between the amygdala and your temporal lobe and the connection to the frontal lobe. And so that that highway, that communication highway, we did exercises to stimulate that pathway. The frontal lobe is really heavily driven by things like fast eye movements, for example, and fast motor, accurate motor activity. So we did things like uh, that NSI device you'd mentioned where we're doing rapid, you know, biofeedback while we're lasering your cerebellum, which pre-programmed. So one of the cool things about the cerebellum is that it we're finding more and more. It's like the, it has over half the neurons of your entire nervous system are in your cerebellum. Wow. That fires even before your frontal lobe does in a lot of ways. So when the cerebellum people will, you know, have things like balance issues, coordination issues, but when they're having trouble finding words and those kind of things, that's also tied into the cerebellum. Um, the frontal lobe is tied into emotion and inhibition and things like that. So, you know, it's the reason why, you know, when somebody, one of your buddies has too many beers and he's naked on the table with a lampshade on, that's frontal and cerebellar inhibition. They, they lose those inhibitory systems. So they start thinking, yeah, this is a good idea. Hold my beer kind of thing. So, so we want to do stuff to make those inhibitory systems stronger. And so that, that, you know, your whole brain is a gas break analogy. You have to have a go system, but you have to have a stop system. So we also did some stuff with you like anti saccades and dual tasking and whatnot. And what those are is that if anyone's played the game, Simon says, go, Simon says, stop, go. Well, that's, for, you know, our tendency is to want to go, right? And, to, you know, you have to have that inhibitory system to say, oh, Simon didn't say. And so we use that, like we do a lot with neurodevelopmental stuff with like autistic kids and things like that. So those are just examples of those inhibitory systems of the brain that even though there's not as many neurons for it, they actually have more energy in their own system and those kind of things. And that's why a lot of people have anxiety and OCD. Because yeah, they don't ADD. get it turned off. It doesn't shut exactly. down. Yeah. So we'll do exercises like anti saccades and go, no, go, like Simon says stuff and things like that to activate those pathways to get that those pa pathways stronger. Because anything you do repetitively in the brain, like learning a new golf swing, that will ultimately start to create new pathways. And then over time, when you've reinforced it enough, that's your new normal. That's yeah. the beauty about brain plasticity. As long as you're living and breathing, you can you can be 85 years old and get your brain function working better. So it's a it's a beautiful thing that we have going for us on that front. You can always rehab the brain. Um, we also worked with gaze stabilization too. What part does gaze stabilization have um, on how someone feels, and what would reduce somebody's ability to have that gaze stabilization? And um, and then and then I th found it totally fascinating to understand just how sort of exhausting that probably was to my system because my eyes didn't stay focused. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a great question because the, the gaze holding centers in your brain stem and it happens to be right by where the vagus nerve is actually. They're right next to each other. And it's so are they correlated or are they just they, next to each other? Exact, for sure okay. they're correlated. Well, technically the whole nervous system, even though we try and compartmentalize it, there's a lot of interconnectivity. So I don't want to be, you know, like left brain, right? But at the end of the day, they're like brother and sister right next to each other because gaze centers are your part of your balance center. Okay. The main part of gaze holding is your balance center. It's the fastest reflex in the human body. It's faster than vision. So our ability to look at a target and move our eyes or head around, I'm sorry, move our head around that target, fastest reflex of the human body. One of the things we see a lot in concussions and whatnot is because that's in the brainstem. Well, if your head's getting rattled around as you're, you know, say you're in your NASCAR, or your uh, cart open wheel, and you take a head or even just the, you know, normal driving experience, that sure. where's the brain? It's floating around in that fluid, but what's it floating on? Your brain stem. So that poor area of the brain is getting a lot of trauma and a lot of shearing and things like that. So one of the mechanisms is actual direct mechanical damage to that area. Well, that's our eyes are basically, if I took your brain and just squeezed it out of your skull and it popped out, that's your eyes. Okay? You can basically with eye movements and eye uh, analysis see a lot, no pun intended, you can analyze a lot of what's going on in the brain based on eye movements and optics and ocular motor stuff. So one of the first things we look at in things like post-concussion is can the eyes lock on a target and stay on that target? 
-hmm. And if they can't, we that's one of our first orders of business is to do gaze holding exercises uh, or what's, what are called vestibular ocular therapies to get the eye stable so that your balance is better. Your awareness of where you are in space, your reaction time is better. You don't fall. That's a big thing. What do they tell you in yoga? If you're doing a balance pose like tree and yeah. you're all over the place, they, your yoga instructor will tell you to lock and fixate on a target. Exactly. Your drishi. Yes, exactly. So that's your gaze holding centers. So one of our first building blocks, like when we build your nervous system back up, you have to be able to um, have those eyes locked in place. So we worked a lot with you to develop that foundation so that everything else we did above it was coming from a good foundation like that. Mm, um, yeah, I, I just I remember when we did that and you said that, um, you know, the what is the normal amount of eye movements in a day? Something one hundred and two thousand yeah, so thousand you know, estimates are around one hundred to one hundred twenty thousand kind of thing. And you were probably doing about four or 500,000 eye movements a day because of all of your extraneous activity and, re, you know, corrections and stuff. Yeah. You know, just your eyes are skeletal muscle. If I'm at the gym and I had you do three sets of 10 with bicep curls and you're like, I can't do anymore. I got lactic acid. I'm tired. And I say, you know what? Do five more of the five more sets of those. What do you think your muscles going to do? Right. What do you think your body is going to do? That's anaerobic respiration. It's, you know, you're building up, you know, you know, free radicals. It's exhausting. You're using up yeah. energy unnecessarily. So we want the nervous system to be efficient. And by getting all those extraneous eye movements out of your equation, your system is going to have a lot more energy to work with to do all the fun stuff you like to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, for those who are listening and they're like, I don't know, maybe I have gaze stabilization issues or I wonder if I do. I mean, I could once you pointed it out, I was like, oh, my God, I absolutely know the times when my eyes it's basically like when you track or when you track across and like they jiggle like yeah. and I had that all the time where I would some and I'd look and all of a sudden I just like it would all jiggle and I'd have to like it wasn't like I lost my place, but I was like, I just had a moment. <laughs> so if somebody kind of notices that there's like a like a like a readjusting every now and again, whether it's close or far and you just kind of like eyes are readjusting for me, that's that was like, oh, yeah, I can totally tell that that's not working properly. Um, so, okay. So what's kind of the general, like if we work down top down from a, a cascade effect of like how important things are, let's talk about like, um, let's talk about, uh, stress, diet, um, lifestyle, um, emotions, um, toxins, like how is there a way to organize it in a hierarchy or is it, or are they all sort of in their own silo affecting the system to a similar degree? I love that question because they do have their, all their own damning qualities about it. But I, if I were to try and put a hierarchy on it, I would say one thing, stress is the underpinning for a lot of our problems. And it mm -hmm. whacks those areas of the brain, like the hippocampus, your memory center. One of the worst ways you can whack that is stress. So we have to get stress out of our system. We have to get, you know, into whether it's our relationships, our careers, whatever, yeah. you know, finding ways to go ground, go Family, look at practice. You know, whatever, go look at practice. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, for sure. That's a big one. The next one I would say is move. You have to move. You know, they've they've done studies and I just put a new one up in my slide that they just came out with a study where they compared diet and exercise together. They compared that in relation to exercise alone diet and lifestyle, like the nutrition stuff alone, and then none of the above. And huh. what they showed is that if you exercise, you could overcome the dietary stuff with the negative qualities of diet. Now, I don't want to just give people the green light to go eat. Hey, you know, yeah, uh, but it's just a, it's just a hierarchy. Yeah. So get out and move. We become way too sedentary. I don't what care. What kind of movement is there? A, is there a certain recommended? Do you need to work at like, do you need to have interval style training? Is it uh, uh, time under tension with muscles, with lifting weights? Is it just purely walking? Like, what, what would yeah. you recommend? I, at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm okay with just getting out and walking. Because if somebody's just sitting at their desk all day and they get out and walk, that's going to be a game changer. But you brought up an excellent point. High intensity interval training is arguably the best way to get new nerve growth factors and insulin resistance under control and things like that. So if we, and the good thing about HIIT training is like, they just did a study that showed five minutes of that or six minutes technically could help prevent Alzheimer's. So when pa patients tell me, I don't have time to work out. If you can't give me three minutes of your day, 
you know, then what, it, what are you supposed to do as a doctor, as a patient? You know, you give me three minutes of high intensity interval training, and that's going to make huge changes in your brain and yeah. your chemistry and your neural health. So what we do with high intensity interval training is one minute on, one minute off, one minute on. And we do that times three minutes that it could be jump rope. It can be elliptical trainer, whatever, it, whatever it is you're doing, just do it in, in training and intervals. Even if you're going for a walk, change, go really brisk for a while and then slow it down and change it up that way. Complex movement patterns, big, like yoga, tai chi, there you go. So new things, novelty is big for the brain. Learning oh, a new yeah, instrument. Oh you know, yeah, a new golf swing or learning how to, you know, play tennis or exactly. whatever. Anything that, learn how to play the piano, like anything that stimulates the brain is, helps with that neuroplasticity, correct? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, new, no so, neuro, new neuro pathways. Now, they, you brought us really big points though, like toxins and viruses and stuff. Those things will just, you know, you have to be able to address those and, and get them under control and, and or get them out of the body. So we look at, you know, heavy metal readings like hair analysis and different things like that, urine analysis. We viruses are like you talk about a major underpinning. This is why a lot of long COVID people are showing dementia stuff hmm. is that now that it's going along, we're seeing some of the, the effects of that. So we need to do stuff to to address the immunology. And that's why lasers are so good, because they can actually go after a lot of the stuff that the pathogens like viruses are doing to the brain in a mm. bad way. The inflammation, the over immune response, like the over inflammation that, you know, you hear about the, the COVID storm and all that stuff. But so, yeah, we have if you if you have a chronic mold exposure or something, good luck having a healthy brain. But in, I can say the exact same thing in a even worse, like an iron deficiency. If you're anemic, you're never going to have, you know, it's almost impossible to have a healthy body. If iron is involved in every enzyme react reaction in the human body. So we had to also do low hanging fruit stuff like a CBC, get labs done on yourself, you know, yeah. eat good foods that have good iron sources like good red meat. This is a yeah. big misconception is that people are like, oh, meat's bad. Yeah. West, you know, when you have industrialized beef, not good. And it's not the meat that's the problem. It's what they put into it. The antibiotics, sure. you know, the, the, the grains that are non-GMO, you know, that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And let's or, just look at it from a metaphysical standpoint. That that cow is not happy. That cow is being put in a line, you know, like, look, I get it. I eat meat. But, you know, there's there's more humane ways than the factory farming. So there's there's what they put into it and and how that how that feels, because if our body is affected by how we feel, their body is affected by how they feel. Exactly. And you bring up a, a really interesting, you know, when you look at that, that collective consciousness and that, you know, non-linearity of time and whatnot, there's so many layers to that that you just opened up that uh, I guess we're going to go. There. No, you just opened it up. No, you did. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, and, 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 and there's a lot of misinformation too, you know, depending on what source you read, you've always got biases, right? You've got, you know, and that, that we that we should address because it's like, yeah, I understand environmental concerns. I'm a Canadian tree hugger by nature, right? So it's like <laughs> I, I want to protect, but it, you know, here we are cutting down the Amazon, the lungs of the earth for the sake of feeding the cows with or you know, getting the soybeans and things like that. that yeah. So like we want to do stuff to protect our environment. And I'm not trying to say that into a, like a politically divisive way. It's just why would we cut out the lungs? Like if I started taking your lung and just methodically cutting it out like we're doing in the Amazon, eventually it's going to catch up to you in your lung field. And it's no different. Yeah. They yeah, are you can lose lung. a chunk of your lungs, but once you lose it all, obviously. Exactly. So how much are we going to give up? That kind of thing. I love some of the documentaries, like what was it? Kiss the ground. It was really fairly done too, like no matter what your political perspective is. So yeah, so we wanted, you know, going back to um, food sources, fish, we can't live without it. They're called essential fatty acids for a reason. So even if uh -huh. you don't want to eat red meat, all right, let's at least eat, be a pescatarian. Yeah. You know? you got to at least eat fish or have a fish source like for your omega-3 fatty acids. So that's a big one. So um, so I would say movement, uh, stress reduction, uh, dietary stuff comes into play, but then address all those other under, underpinnings like, you know, the more micro, micro, the, the, the sort of micro micro problems, meaning like mold, mold exposure, toxicity. Exactly. And find a practitioner that's more holistic and integrated yeah. that's actually going to look under all of those stones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you make, like you had talked about long COVID and stuff, you know, what, what do you make about, uh, people just kind of dropping 
dropping to the ground these days. Like, you know, the football player that the football player that, you know, the Bills player that um, fell down on the field. You look at you see all these little videos of people. They're soccer players. There's people giving speeches. There's people on television. It's basically like just people doing what they're doing. And you just watch them like does that have to do with, I mean, that seems very brain oriented. Yeah. And, and while they're actually, this one does get down a little bit more to the cardiovascular level. Like huh. one of the top cardiologists I know said, we are seeing more signs of myocardial. He's, he's, he's been in practice over 30 years. He said, I'm seeing more signs of, of, of cardio, but like myocardial inflammation yeah. in the last couple of years. And I've seen in 30 years of practice. Hmm. Okay. Now, you know, where what is smoking. myocarditis? It's the inflammation of the cardiac tissue. Oh, any, okay. Yeah. Any what itis? Causes that? Yeah. Well, okay. So it's like we get into this whole thing. I uh, what I try and do is have a pragmatic conversation about vaccines. All right. I'm sorry, but there is risk involved in vaccines. That's just the nature of the beast. And the problem is you can't. You know, if you start to kind of address vaccine risks you get censored. Like, look at what happened to Robert Malone. He's like the mRNA really. guy. And as soon as he- Thank God up, for Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, here you've got a guy that literally got shut down. All he was doing was trying to have a pragmatic conversation saying, look, there are risks involved and we don't know everything that's going to happen with the mRNA, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, it, and I'm seeing, you know, vaccine injuries more than I ever have. And most mm -hmm. of it is cardiovascular based. So, you know, endothelial inflammation and things like that, as well as dysautonomia both in COVID and with the vaccine. What that is, you've heard of conditions like POTS and things like that. That happens in the brainstem. And that's where, because we talked about, remember we just talked about how the eyes and the balance center were directly brother and sister to your yeah. cardiac, like your vagal yeah. nerve stuff and things like that. Yeah. And that area gets hit hard with a lot of these things. It even gets hit hard with mold, for example. And so then what happens is people have problems when they go to stand up, they don't have the right blood pressure. They don't have the right heart rate. And so you could imagine what's happening to their system when it's going all over the map because you only have about four and a half liters of blood. And that brainstem that we're talking about, it's like a traffic cop says, OK, Danica's standing up, blood, you go here. Danica's leaning forward, blood, you go here, that kind of thing. OK, we're, we're having a thought, you, blood, you go here. Well, if it's getting mixed signals or like with a concussion or it's inflamed and it's not it's your your not functioning stuck. properly like if you have inflammation like let's say in your core it's not going to go to your head as well because it's essentially like a like a traffic jam exactly and or another good analogy it's like you have a the fight or flight that you mentioned earlier that's the sympathetics when the resting digesting that's your break so you have gas fight or flight resting digesting is your parasympathetic when you're under attack by something, a virus or, or you know, something, uh, uh, an immune response that's going after, you know, like a vaccine, you, your foot can get stuck on the gas pedal. Not a good thing. If you're going that brain that's going 200 miles an hour, you better have a brake system to stop it. And if we can't get into that resting, digesting state and our foot's stuck on the gas pedal, your blood, your blood pressure is in that same umbrella. And so it, it can't regulate properly for whatever it is you're trying to do. So that's the, when you hear terms like dysautonomia, that's kind of a general term of that part of your brainstem being most of the time it's stuck on the gas pedal. You do have times where your foot's stuck on the brake and you can't get it off. So that you have, but you have to be able to address both of those. So. Mm, okay. That's a great explanation. That makes a lot of sense. What about CTE? I mean, for all of my sports fans out there and yeah. even anybody that anything that you have to wear a helmet is probably a concern, but there's a lot of people that played sports in school. Like, but of course, once you do it for long enough, um, what, it, what is CTE? How, what is it and how is it treated? Okay. That's uh, so CTE stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And that's what that is, is basically taking all these mechanisms that we're talking about, like with brain inflammation and protein misfolds, like the Golden Gate Bridge coming apart and whatnot. And it's just over time, that's what happens. And what happens if I punch Bruce Banner and turn him into the Hulk and I keep punching him, guess yeah. what the Hulk's going to do? I'm going to stay the Hulk because you keep ticking me off. And so now the Hulk just keeps destroying the city over a long period of time. Okay. When you look at the brain of a CTE patient, it looks very similar to that of an Alzheimer's patient. 
Hmm. That wasting away, that cortical atrophy where the, the mass, those fractals that the brain is of all those infoldings, they waste away and you get these big open spaces because there's not as many neurons anymore. Hmm. And then so then we go in, you know, and then that we start to lose frontal control. We become more impulsive. We become more aggressive. You know, that's why you hear a lot of the like the football players and stuff sure. more maybe homicidal or suicidal, like all these things that we could yeah. normally inhibit they start to go away. So mm. you, you want, and it, you know, to your point, it can, obviously football is a big one, but like in females, the number one cause of concussions is soccer, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you know, but you see it every, we've all been in car accidents. We've yeah. all, and it doesn't even have to be head injury. It can be body impacts. It can be cumulative effect. It doesn't have to be like the one big one. It's multiple impacts, but technically food and other things like that, that aren't healthy for you, are basically chemically concussing your brain. So it's it's like having multiple NASCAR accidents it can be analogous to eating bad food all the time. It's like you're chemically concussing your brain. So they all can end up in that net effect of brain atrophy, like where it's dying off. We lose the connections. We can't, you know, the brain can't do what it normally does. The leaky barriers then open up the floodgates even more. The brain can't talk to the gut. We're getting malabsorption stuff. You know, and just you can see the brain controls everything. So when it starts to go down, your whole body goes into a spiral. So, okay, I just had a thought because um, so does first off, the lasers are going to do they regrow your brain? Do they help it fill in for these little gaps of atrophy? Do they do that? That's one of the coolest okay. things. Yeah. Okay, so I totally forgot when I went and did a brain scan with Dr. Amen. Yeah. He was like, so we I do the brain scan, then we're having something to eat before we go in and do the interview portion for his show. And uh, I wanted some coffee finally because I wasn't able to have coffee before the test. And so I, you know, he, we were sitting down and they came in with the folder with the results. And I was like, oh my God, I want some coffee. I don't even care if it's moldy. I just want some coffee. <laughs> and, um, and so he looked at my chart. He looked at the results real quick and the imaging. And he was like, um, yeah, you can have coffee. And then afterwards he was like, I mean, basically it was like, you have a beautiful brain. Like my brain looked almost like the ideal brain which was just shocking to everyone and as this is like when it happened i was like wow i guess you know my diet helps and working out but i totally forgot that last year we did all this laser stuff and we did it in a concentrated amount of time so we got a huge dose of it so it was you know 12 sessions over a month so like you know i had i was in there a couple of times a week and um yeah i i am sure that is probably why my brain looked beautiful yeah and it, i love what amon's doing like the spec studies because it's more yeah. functional based right it's not just yeah. a static image like an x-ray or an mri it tells you how the pathways are you know the the way the fuels go into different parts of the brain so mm -hmm. yeah that's one of the cool things is that there are studies that that show that like the holy grail would be to make new neurons like your neurons don't replicate they don't go through mitosis and so to get new neurons like stem cell activation with lasers, uh, new neuronal neurogenesis and mitochondrial, like the powerhouse, with, you can do it with lasers. The key is, again, like I have my two of my first slides are low dose. It has to be like one study was one joule per centimeter squared. One was 0.8. So, again, it goes back to why I only use Ericonia because they they can actually, it wasn't an Erconia laser that in the study, but that it was, a, you know, very similar parameters that, that what Erconia does. And so that is like the Holy grail. And then the, you, then all you got to do is, is connect, right? You're getting all these new, uh, new neurons, but the, the, the growth factors that are connecting the neurons together, making them talk, there's, there's terms like BDNF nerve yep. growth factor. Yeah. Yep. Well, lasers actually promote those protein replications of BDNF. God, and then will you, you please your... set up my laser so I can laser my brain every day? There we go. The, I don't want to like, elect, I don't want to like burn a hole in the wall, even though I know you can't because it's a cool laser. But one of the things that showed up in the brain scan, which is a perfect parlay into this next part of the conversation, and I'm super interested to see here if there's any studies or what the research shows. Um, and I asked Dr. Amen about this, but one of the things he asked about when he was looking at my brain and the very center of my brain in the middle was middle was lit up because what they do is you're doing a, a, a basic 
sort of test where you're just basically hitting a space bar if you see the X pop up amongst all the letters. Like just don't hit the space bar with the X. So it's very repetitive, but it shows where your brain is pumping, firing essentially. Yeah. So they inject a radio dye into you to sort of give you give them a snapshot of what that is. And then you go in the machine, the MRI machine, and it scans. But he said, this little spot right here, he's like, tell me about uh, psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> I was like, well, I just got back from Burning Man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, oh, no, actually, it was, I think I had just gotten back from Burning Man. Um, so anyway, what um, are there any studies on the uh, benefits of plant medicine and the brain and neuroplasticity and new neurons or... Um, or, or perhaps brain growth just in any way, like uh, maybe we're activating dormant DNA, like drop it on us. There you go. You, <laughs> I love it. This is so such a cool area of research. Like just one or example. ayahuasca, of course, which is what you had mentioned early. Yeah. Johns Hopkins just don't, they put $17 million in a psilocybin research re in the recent years. And one of the reasons they're doing that they're putting, and so we're getting really good clinical studies done again on this stuff. Um, and to your point, there are, there are, they are showing like, read everything you can. I know you have, but Paul Stamets, he's like the yeah. mushroom guru, right? Oh yeah. He was at Burning Man too. I yeah. went and saw him talk. I, I love was like, it. So yeah, without mushrooms, without fungi, like this planet, we're toast. We need that. They're like the great equalizer for our planet to keep our ecosystems alive, things like that. But it also, it's been shown to uh, you know, psilocybin and mushroom derivatives like lion's mane and whatnot have been shown to increase nerve growth factors like those proteins we were just talking about, change your microbiome in a positive, the good bacteria in you, regulate your immune responses, just like the lasers can do. If your immune system's overactive, it'll calm it down. If it's underactive, it can help promote it. So yeah, mushrooms are really good for that. But if you want to stabilize people that are uh, uh, like bipolar, for example, mm -hmm. for example, psilocybin is a way to do that anxiety mushrooms can do that actually technically all the classic psychedelics like peyote and mescaline like ayahuasca like ibogaine psilocybin they all are really good for stabilizing mood like anxiety mm. addiction mm. for sure like if you're if i was going to lose a kid to like an opiate addiction like narcotics or gotten like fentanyl and all the stuff that's going on right now I would get them to an ibogaine clinic. They don't have them in the United States anymore, but mm. they have them in Canada, Costa what is Rica. That? Ibogaine, it's 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 like the grandfather. It's a it's an African derivative. That's the ultimate reset button. It takes all of your ego. Not iboga? Is it iboga? Iboga or e some okay. people her pronounce iboga or iboga. Okay. Okay. Ibogaine. Yeah, it's a yeah. big one. That's a big one. And I'm going to tell you right now, Danica. I tried it because I'm not one to tell people to go do something if I haven't tried it myself. Sure. I, I sat for a day with Iboga and it was the hardest 24 hours of my life. It literally rings out everything about your psyche, your ego, that kind of stuff. But you come out on, like literally studies show and, and both, you know, anecdotally as well, too. People come out of these Iboga clinics completely free of opiate addiction and things like that. But in a smaller scale, mushrooms like psilocybin can do it ayahuasca is like the master, uh, is the mother ceremony. It is the one that, you know, it's when you think of the, the best analogy I give, it's like a near death experience. You hear about these stories of people, you know, you know, they died for some reason clinically and they're getting drawn to the light and they're being with God and things like that. That energy, that love that is God's energy kind of thing is, you know, mm -hmm. that universal love. And you, I know we've both had experiences where it's like, that's, you, if you're in that place, it's the most euphoric, like words can't do it justice on. How no, it's an, it's an awareness. It's not even like you can't, the words are not don't. It, there's too much. Essentially there's just too much information. It's not, yeah. you can't break it down into a sentence. You can't break it down into a conversation. It holds way more information than that because it, it affect it. it you can feel it too. And you, it's very, it's hard to describe the way something feels just like you can't like articulate or define love necessarily similar. Like you can't, yeah. it's too much information. Yeah. It's, it's a pureness that's indescribable and my man ego would never be able to do it justice. So what, what they've done and the, where I'm getting to with this is if you, one of the things that Johns Hopkins is working is 
they're giving cancer patients so high dose and that I'm careful set and setting right that's right a big right, thing. right right and these are scheduled you know when you look at their, their you know the substances are legal mostly in the United States some some places are starting to decriminalize them thankfully mm -hmm. but as a brain person they are one of the most important things that we're going to get to with neuropsych stuff like depression like anxiety because SSRIs and stuff. I'm sorry, that's not doing anything. Exercise yeah. will blow SSRIs out of the yeah. water. Yeah. Let alone diet will, will blow yeah. SSRIs. Out. I exactly. mean, I feel like you hear, uh, you know, the Peterson family, Michaela and Jordan, talk a lot about that kind of stuff. Michaela's been very forthcoming with all of that and how diet cured it all, not SSRIs, and the the backlash of that. It was so detrimental. Yeah, and and so the fear of dying, like, because with cancer, if it, if it comes back. That's, you know, that's not a good sign. So what they do is they give people with life life threatening illnesses when they give them a, a psilocybin, like a hero's dose, as they talk about, where you you have that godlike experience. If that's what's waiting for us on the other side, guess what? People lose their fear of dying because, you know, if anything, you'd be like, oh, well, if that's what's going. Then, you know, I, I can't you know, it's it's almost inviting. I can't wait. And I'm talking about just on our physical construct. Right? Yeah. Obviously yeah. What is death, what is, you know, but that is a big thing that I, I, I mean, once I had my, and here's another thing I'll mention to get when I had my godlike ayahuasca weekend, it was my first time sitting with ayahuasca. It was the worst trip I could ever imagine. But I'm of the belief there's no such thing as a bad trip, so to speak, because once I finally let go of my ego and my default mode network, and I truly, in my deepest sense at the time when I was on that trip, I said, I have, I just want to die right now, but I meant it in like the bit, the, the root of my core and every cell, every DNA of my body. I felt that feeling. And as soon as I truly felt that the a lights, I went into this space and I got projected into the space of dark energy and dark matter. And I was with God's energy and love. And it was just the most, and it was literally like a light switch turned off when I truly let myself die. Yeah, so not just like, oh, I'm going to let go. But when you just embody letting go, there's a big difference between saying letting go and feeling letting go to truly embody an emotion is the magic of the universe. Bingo. And that's why leading with your heart, like one of the ceremonies I sat with, the shaman came over and I was stuck. My energy was stuck. And can I swear on your? Yeah, show? of course. He goes, he comes up to me. Everyone's in ceremony. It was like 14 of us on our mats. And I was stuck and he was working with my energy and moving it around. And he leaned into me. He goes, Trevor, you got an amazing brain. He's, your intelligence. He goes, quit fucking using it. Use your heart. <laughs> the shaman put his hand on my heart. And as soon as I did that, everything just opened up. And didn't you just post something today on social media about using leading with your heart yeah. and all the thoughts and stuff. And so, yeah, it's, it's so to get to those places, sometimes those plant-based medicines allow us to see things that we could never do when we're stuck in our default mode network, in those salience networks and our central network system, because we start to perseverate. And we sometimes when that sled is going down the hill and it's stuck yeah. in that groove, Too much you momentum. need a fresh coat of powder so that that sled can go down a different route down that hill and your life begins, you know, in a whole different trajectory. And that's what the plant-based medicines do in ways that, to your point, making new pathways. And these pathways, they're showing now in long-term studies, like the Johns Hopkins major depression study, not just a month later, but they just did a year follow-up that showed they were still good a year later with depression. Wow. So it's long-term neuroplasticity, new connections, that kind of stuff. And yes, the classic psychedelics can do all of that. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a big fan. I don't think there's, I, I mean, I think you can access other transcendental spaces through meditation and various different things and just breathing somewhere breathing. where you're breath work, yeah, of course, yeah. and some, some other things, but, um, but there's nothing that's going to, um, uh, give you a, a more, a bigger door to that space than the psychedelics, than the, than the plant medicines. Um, and, but you do have to surrender. That is a hundred percent part of it. People that go into ceremony and they say they didn't have anything happen. I all, I know immediately that their guard is so far up and they're yep. not able to let go and surrender because you have to surrender to get the experience. Yeah. And that's very difficult when we have ego. And that's the whole thing is deconstructing our ego. And just as the Beatles song, like relax and float downstream, right? So the sea in the sky. <laughs> there you go.
Yeah, um, I didn't know for the longest time that song was about LSD. And, yeah, you know, right. You'd grow it up. I love this the song. Sky right? with diamonds. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah. They knew it was up. The Beatles knew it was up. You're working with the brain and neurology and um, pathways and neuroplasticity and epigenetics and these spaces that are more progressive in the scientific field. They're not, um, you know, this is we're working in digital versus analog, it feels like. And the people we're learning more and more all the time. And as you just said at the beginning, we now know another layer of the brain that's got a cool name called slime. Um, very, very technical. I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it stands for something. Um, but what is it, uh, what is it that's building our reality? I'm curious what your thoughts, your opinion, or perhaps what you know, um, what research has shown that builds this reality, um, because the brain and, and what the role of the brain is like, what is the brain? What is its function? And what is building this reality? To dovetail off the psychedelic side of things, if you look at, you know, you, you hear these terms like we only use X percent of our brain and things yeah. like that. And that's, you know, in our in our current form as it is and our, our constructs, our man-made limitations or, or you know, self-limitations, if you will, um, we only get to appreciate certain elements. But if you think of it as universal intelligence, like there's an energy out there. And again, this gets into those definition things. Is it God? You know, everyone's definition of God is, you know, different, that kind of thing that energy that that is out there and they're starting to study it more and more like the CERN super collider you know the yeah. boson god particle all that stuff but as we look into that that's one of the things that plant-based medicine does it allows us to peer over our own veil of ego and our own limitations and look into that bigger picture and so there's some thought that what the, you know we're just we're getting that universal waveform that we're all in interconnected and that our consciousness just intersects those waves because, you know, everything, the quantum model is that's, that's exactly is what it is. Yeah, everything's a wave. Right. And it's when our con when we look at a table and touch, it's our consciousness that intersects those waves and turns it into, you know, how we table. describe it and how we because non-locality has been proven to the, the table's not really here until observed. That's exactly. it. That's proven now. And that's one of the beautiful things about mescaline and peyote is that it allowed me I, I felt like I literally was one with the world, the mount, I was actually being buried alive out in the desert. And the beauty of it, I had no fear. I had no, it was like, this is the coolest thing. I was connected to the mount, like all these in inanimate objects, like mountains and everything was becoming one. And that's what, you know, that's part of those vision quests and those trips is just to appreciate that we're all connected. Our vibration, you know, you talked about quantum entanglement. We will go two different directions and yet still have the exact same properties you know, going either way and that kind of thing. But then you look at um, how consciousness, when we look at it for more of a reductionist model. So I'm, we've been talking a lot about expanding outside, you know, in that direction. But as we start to look inside of the human body and how we're made up of fractals, our universe is fractals, our, the wilderness, trees, ferns. I, I, when I messaged you the other day, I said, you know, my spirit animal is what? Romanesco broccoli. It's that fractal pattern. It's and the most the things, beautiful vegetable in the world. Right? Isn't it? And so one thing I know when I'm sitting in, in ceremony is that when I start seeing those fractal patterns, a lot of people are cool with that. It's like this cool visual collider. Sure. Right. But that's actually almost like a gateway that tells me, oh, I'm about to have a big lesson coming my way. And once you get through those fractal patterns, then you open up to the other side. And it, she gives, you know, th these medicines give different teachings each time. Like yeah. I've sat with ayahuasca now about 14 times. I've had a different experience completely every time. Because There's such a great saying, it doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. Bingo. And you just literally took the words right out of my mouth. So, so that is one element. But I'm realizing as I look back at the, the so we started with the, the Penrose, uh, you know, hammer off <laughs> model. And, and we're, this is a beautiful segue into it because I'm realizing if that theory is correct, and we look at the reduction going inside ourselves because we are God, we are, you know, that kind of thing within our own embodiment. If you look at it from trying to do the scientific model, and this is where it gets tough. This is where I love Terrence McKenna's quote. He goes, how are you going to learn how a clock works by smashing it to pieces so you can study the different pieces? You know, what a, what a you know, I'm paraphrasing him, but it was something. Yeah, yeah. So it be, that's where the scientific model becomes very difficult because the more we 
pull stuff apart and break it apart to look at it, the harder it is to really see how it works as a whole. So that's it's like when of, those UFO crafts crashed in Roswell and they had to put it back together. They weren't sure how to do it. They've been working on it for decades. What a great example. What a great analogy. And and, and we'll, maybe we'll get even have time to get into that cross beam in Egypt, you know, looking at the, the UFO. And the, yeah, but I wore my what, cartouche what, today just for good luck. Oh, I love it. I, I had a bunch of those brought back. With my I, name on the back. I didn't. I, I didn't even think. I have. I did a wrist one. I love that though. Those are so pretty. Um, yeah. And and so with the as we go into the neurons or into our body, it's fractals everywhere. The patterning. It's that. It, if, if anyone's not familiar with fractals, it's the most beautiful visual. It's it's the mathematical equation that's never ending. Yes. Um, and, and and when it's represented in a physical, actually, you know what I did was I think I I downloaded. Uh, a picture actually I'll, I'll pull it up later but if you look if people want to google mandelbrot set and mm -hmm. you can see those fractal patterns and you can actually just stare at it well fractal patterns have a range of one to two so they and what mother nature has done is its fractal ratio is typically 1.3 to 1.5 and that has to do with the complexity of those fractals so you know a, a really good example for for a certain demographic would be like a jackson pollock painting yeah. What what they have found out was his paintings. He was actually painting in fractal ratios. Stop it. He, yes. And what? so when he first started painting, his ratio was very simple. It was just a 1.0 ratio. But by the time his career ended or he stopped painting, it was 1.7. Did That's he how know he was doing that on purpose? No. Or was that that was just that was just he he is just part of the damn pattern. Exactly. We are pattern making machines. Like, Ex oh my God. Exactly. And so Mother Nature is a pattern making machine. Look at look oh at God. your cardiovascular system. It's tree roots. That's branches. your heart. That's your blood vessels in your heart. Look at that fractal pattern. It looks oh, like it's a beautiful. Tree. I was uh, on mushrooms one time and I watched my veins sprouting crystals. And that was essentially what it was doing. It was constantly like sprouting and it's growing and crystals. And it was like, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And my body said, I love you so much. I'm doing this for you all the time. Oh my God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that such, those lessons that you get, those epiphanies, that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, with the, the, like mother nature in that 1.3 to 1.5, if you have a patient trying, like the studies show, if you look at fractal patterns in that range, you'll have a 60% reduction in stress. <gasps> what? Oh my yes. God. You're reorganizing your brain. Yeah. So we're fractal beings. Oh my Everything God. You know, in Egypt, they said that some of the, um, like the Ram and different faces, they actually activated based on their geometry, your brain in certain ways. Exactly. And those sacred, the sacred geometry is what that's all about. Right. And so that was like, you know, just being out in nature. If you want, if you're a patient in a hospital bed, get to a window that you yeah. can see outside, your healing capacity is going to go up greatly just by seeing fractal patterns. We're using it now, even like look at Ben Weiss's uh, TED talk on fractals. Okay. He's kind of like one of Mandel Mandelbrot's disciples. Okay. They're using uh, those Mandelbrot sets in learning disability, in cognitive behavioral stuff, things like that, just based on staring at a fractal pattern activation. So then you look at it inside your body, your lung feels like the bronchial tree, your capillary, your blood vessel bed, your brain, all those folds on top of each other are fractal patterns. Your neurons, all the dendrites that connect to each other, it's all fractal patterns and it looks exactly like, and I did download one more and I did this small because if you look, okay. one yeah, of those oh, yeah. Neuro, neurons, one's a neuron, one's the universe. Yeah, exactly. Of course, okay. you can't tell the difference because they're a fractal because no matter together. how much you zoom in or how much you zoom out, it's the same pattern. Exactly. So now we go keep going into the neuron. Now we're back to the microtubule that we started with. And the quantum consciousness model of Penrose and Hameroth is to say that with to have a supercomputer that like you, if you do quantum computing, it's non-binary, right? It's not one and zero. It's somewhere in between and it can be in any configuration at any time. So to be able to have this type of activity, you have to have fractal patterns that the electrons are bouncing around it. And that's what they are saying is the theory of quantum consciousness is the fractal pattern in that microtubule. So in a, in a, you know, when you look at it from a reductionist standpoint, it's not because it's actually opening up into that realm of those fractal patterns in our brains that are tapping into the universal connectiveness of fractal patterns that are never ending. 
Have you heard of Nassim Haramein? I have. Yeah. He was, he said one, uh, at one point that we are our own black hole. And Ooh, like that, that yeah. when I saw a video by this girl named Sarah Alcaldi that I interviewed, she goes by the alchemist on Instagram. She's fascinating. Um, she has great videos on YouTube as well. Um, but she had just posted something the other day talking about basically kind of the universe within you kind of a theory, but far more scientific or like deeper than that. And my reply to her was, does this account for quantum entanglement. Because I think about quantum entanglement and you think about it's the equal and opposite reaction instantaneously, no matter how far apart the, part the particles are. Exactly. So the only thing that kind of like, I don't know, we actually have the hardware to even ask the right question or complete or understand. I'm not sure we have the, I don't think we have the hardware, but maybe. Or maybe we are continuing to grow into that hardware. But my question was, does this explain something to do with quantum entanglement? Because if it's if it's equal and opposite and instantaneous, there seems like there has to be some kind of uh, black hole, loophole, some kind of loop that happens within all of us that is mimicking in, in the rest of the universe. And so I responded with that. And she said, you've just actually hit on exactly what my next video is about because, yes, you're onto something. And I was like, oh, my God. That's well said. I love it. And another interesting side note on on that element is with the fractals is that um, with the 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 most recent studies that are being done, there's like a Sierpinski triangle. I don't know if you've read about any of that at all, but it's like some of the top quantum researchers are using some of these. They're trying to create a model that that they could you know use as the model for quantum you know quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing, guess what they're doing to activate this this triangle? It's the fractal model that they're using is that they put a photon of light into the tip of it. And guess what happens? It exponentially communicates with the entire fractal pattern. So this gets into why light therapies, we're, we're light-driven beings. If without the sun, we're not here. Without light energy, without that kind of wavelength, and we're not here. We don't exist. Plants don't exist. We're toast. Gosh, so you think about mycelium even. When you think about fungi and the fungi you know uh universe essentially in the soil the mycelium is con co communicating it's an in it's a system of communication just like your brain or just like the universe it's fractal exactly and so so one of the neat ideas then that that takes you know where my mind goes with the laser neurology stuff is that we're just tapping into activating these fractal patterns yeah based on just using and i again i'm grossly overstating this but that's Sierpinski triangle method that's actually getting that light photon energy into the body it doesn't have to be a high amount it doesn't that's what the research shows as well just getting that low dose and goes mm -hmm. and so i love that and i think one way to get to those answers too and that's why a lot of the high thinkers you know the steve jobs one that there's a lot of known activity with psilocybin and lsd and stuff in silicon valley and some of elon the musk goes to burning man all the time it, well it, and i love it and so to get to these answers sometimes you got to get out of it's like einstein's you know you can't be in the same mindset of what created those problems you have to get above it well how do we do that the plant-based medicine will help facilitate that so we can get into areas of consciousness or whatever however you want to define it where we can come up with different epiphanies and solutions and answers that we can't get in this current embodiment yeah what did you learn when you went to egypt do you feel like any puzzle pieces came together or 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 a or a really important question arose from the experience. Was that your first time to Egypt? That was my first time. Yeah, and so you went last year, and and I went the year before. And um, you know, for me, I definitely came away with like, we don't get it. But I'm curious what your experience was like and how that plays into consciousness, fractals, geometry, uh, and reality. Yeah. You know, to, to, for them to have the answers to like, let's just put the placement of the Great Pyramid in Giza. You know, it's so perfect. It's perfectly aligned, thirty degrees latitude, perfectly north, north, south, east, west. But when you look at even the the parameters of it, it's in the ratios associated with the entire universe. The Earth's radius, diameter, and whatnot is built into the size of the pyramid. Our distance, time, you know, the time mechanism is built into the size of the pyramids. The ratio of, you know, when you hear of like terms like one to 43,200, like what the Earth's circumference yeah. and diameter, mm -hmm. 
Randall Carlson does an amazing job with the mm -hmm. sacred geometry stuff. He's you're brilliant with that stuff, along with Graham Hancock. And whatnot. Robert but Edward Grant, too. I've interviewed him and I've become friends with him. And he is all up in the set in the geometry, especially yeah. of Egypt. And, the and then even the alignment, you know, you look at yeah. Graham Hancock's worth. And maybe I won't go too deep down that because you could ever, you know, he's been so like his new Netflix special those yeah. daddy part it's so phenomenal good. i recommend everyone watch it but even the alignment you know one of the things that that i had happened that was tied into egypt that was a huge epiphany because well, i didn't know this when i had my my first when i was projected into like when i was with god in heaven and all this stuff is that i was in the areas of like um you know the stars and and the alignment what what's the theory is is that the pyramid when you look at the the placement of the king and the king, the king and queen's tombs are you know, yeah the chamber up, yeah yeah the chamber sorry that when you go up into that area they talk about those shafts yeah. and you know the classic Egypt halls well it's just ventilation shafts no what the the Egyptians believe was that they were trying to project their souls to Orion's belt Osiris Isis you know for so that their souls could be in the heavens for eternity and the alignment of the queen shaft and the king shaft are exactly where they need to be to project mm -hmm. that. And that was based on the procession of, you know, when you look at that, the time of their uh, alignment and when it was developed, there's perfect alignment with Orion's belt, like the three pyramids and the way they are, the direction, the way the Sphinx is looking, all that stuff was back in Leo. So, and I, you know, I was, one of my experiences with the medicine was I was in that place and I didn't even know it at the time. But then when I went to Egypt and realized that's where they were trying to project to, but it was ayahuasca that allowed me to get there. So then you see all throughout the hieroglyphics and whatnot that there is evidence of them doing psychedelics, plant-based stuff. You'll see on some of the, you know, they're holding the pipe and the, sure. the smoke and things like that. You know, the belief is that they're actually, you know, using that for higher brain function and getting to levels of conscious awareness or in, you know, endeavors that you, you couldn't in the physical form, let alone for eternity kind of thing. So they have their gateways that you saw there and, you know, their, their false doors and things like that. Um, what was the one temple, the Newt chapel ceiling? It was actually a gateway. It was like this enclosed building. That's a gateway um, to project to the astro. So a lot of the astrological stuff that's out there, was tied into Egypt, but I know the one you and I are dying to talk about is that is that cross beam that's at um, the Temple of Surti and uh, Abydos. And oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, of course, with the Flower of Life. Yeah, well, and then there's the uh, when you look at the um, you, the the progression. There's a submarine. There's a UFO. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, that one. There's a helicopter. There's that's right the hieroglyphs that show that that you show literally like it's a helicopter. It's a boat. It's a, a boat, a submarine, a UFO. Like come on. And so they try and pawn it off with these theories. Like well, it was actually um, when you when you try and superimpose Surti over Ramses, then that's actually when you put their names together in hieroglyphics, you get this. You know, that was one of the theories. I'm like, oh, so all of a sudden those make uh, and but even if that were the case, because a lot of times they'll superimpose as another ruler takes over, they change the hieroglyphics. So I, I'm not dismissing that. But to use that theory as what explains there's a UFO. Yeah. Uh, summary, like, I'm sorry, that that doesn't jive with me. So, you know, I, I, I challenge everyone to Google that and look at that cross beam and make your own judgment because it has been confirmed or affirmed that. Um, that is actually done in times where these, you know, some region didn't, exist. didn't exist. Exactly. So that was a really big eye opening. I stood there and stared at that for I don't know how long, just trying to, to absorb that and see, because then it brings in the question of, OK, we, we know the government's just opened up, what, 400 documents of classified information of UFO sightings and things like that. So we know that some of them has been dismissed as actually identified as like a drone or something like that. But there is a lot of them. They're going, yep. Dude, you know. we went to Mars with a drone. Why do people think it's so freaking outside the box that something visits us? Like literally we are on another planet. Lur. Exactly. So to think that we're the only ones with intelligent life form and whatnot that exists, I think that's a little bit of a a, a stretch, especially even as, you know, the, the biggest doubters, as, as we start to get more and more, you know, proof, if you will, or evidence that, that we're seeing alien life, like UFOs and things like that. And, and let alone what you see in the, in the common denominators of people that have been, you know, uh, you know, when you talk about abductions or different things like that, whatever the, the experience is, 
there has to be more than what we allow for based. And again, it's a comfort thing. I get there's a safety zone. Nobody wants to think that, you know, like the movies, like Independence Day, like something's going to come down. Yeah, that's exactly how it's going to go. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like if, you know, if the if if it's all about that universal intelligence and it's love is the universal language coming from here, then yeah. you know, let's just tap into that. Let's all stay connected. Let's all be brother and sister. Let's well, all, you know, do this together and quit being so divisive. And and that's where Burning Man and things like that does do such a good job. I think everyone you coming to Burning Man 2023. I, I definitely would would invite that. I've been me, I've done like LI. I know you've got some good outfits. I know that. <laughs> I know yes, that. I do have a few of those. So <laughs> I will take you up on that. Well, Burning Man 2023, I'll put it on my radar here. So uh man, I imagine that you know it's nothing like Independence Day. It's if there was an extraterrestrial entity that came through i imagine it to be like how you talked about um being in a different space with plant medicine and being like in the soil and part of the earth and you felt totally at peace and love i imagine that there are so many benevolent entities and that their their presence they would be able to affect me on on a level of consciousness that would make me at peace and at ease. So when I walk outside at night to walk the dogs, because I just get a little scared of coyotes jumping the wall. When I go outside with them at night, I imagine I'm like, okay, I look up every night and I'm like, show me some. See, I want to see. I'm like, come. I'm like, wait, nope, scared to shit. No, nope, no, nope, scared. <laughs> and I run inside. Like, I'm not sure I'm ready, but maybe when I actually fully surrender and I am embodying ready, then they will show up. Um, so I or imagine they, that maybe they're be... there the whole time, but it takes something like the higher vibration level of being with plant based medicine that actually allows us to yes. interconnect with it. Yes. Yeah. So what is, what is like the future of consciousness? Like maybe let's not even, I don't want to, I don't want to get to like sciency. I want to keep it in the realm of philosophy, spirituality, uh, where, what is the future of consciousness as we transcend to what we could maybe say like next level? I think going back without getting too scientific oh my goodness danica that is a that is the question beyond questions like i'd almost have to be in an altered state with the plant based stuff to actually do that answer justice because all right reach into your drawer i'll go into mine okay <laughs> <laughs> Now, just for those watching, I'm not in the United States right now. I'm outside of the country as I reach into my, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wink, wink. No, it's, yeah. So, oh my goodness. Well, what is your thought on that? Because I, 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 I want to. Okay. All right. All right. I'll give you some, I'll give you some moments. I imagine that the, that the next state, the next level of consciousness um, is where uh, the most prevalent information that we use to navigate in our day is the orientation to our emotional body and intuition. We call it intuition because it's just the best word we have for it. It doesn't sound very scientific, except there's information from the field coming to us and giving it to our body. And so since we are having such a hard time deciphering like what's bullshit and what's not, like what's propaganda, what's a lie in the media, like we don't know. And I think that it's calling us to go inward and use our own biological system, neurofeedback, biological feedback to navigate the world from a new plane of existence from with a with a a different kind of awareness and i think that then when we look one step further or one step over i think that also consciousness will elevate when as you say come together i think when masculine and feminine energy within each and every one of us is balanced and united in a pure, healthy, productive way, respectful way. I think that when we go into a relationship with anyone else, whether it be a partner, a friend, family, whatever that is, we now have a different relationship with the with the people around us because we are no longer triggered. We are no longer in our ego. We are merely honoring 
ourselves and the other for where they shine. And in those two, with those two things, I don't think there's any way that we don't transcend the reality that we live in today. You know, that's, that's beautifully stated by <laughs> that. You, you, you got a whole book going right there. Danica. <laughs> I, I love that. That was, I, I don't even know how to follow up on that, but I, I love how you said that because I do think that that when we can deconstruct our own egos and get to that place of pureness and and mm-hmm. that inner peace that we don't have to prove anything to anyone that we're not against each other that we're together anything that gets us to that place is going to allow uh, you know not just our world but the entire you know universal intelligence and community you know that we connect into we can open up and into that. And to do that, that's one of the reasons I love the, again, not to perseverate on it, but the plant-based medicines are kind of the, one of the main opportunities that we have to break through that, that mm-hmm. and, and deconstruct ourselves to get to that place. So I, I love it. I think as it becomes more mainstream, which I hate that term, but it's like more accepted would maybe be a better way of doing that. Not this taboo, you know, the war on drugs and and that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't want people in trouble out there. I don't want fentanyl. I don't want overdose. I don't want, I don't even want marijuana being too manipulated to have a high THC content that can be inflammatory or done too early to create psychotic break. You know, there's, there's always risks involved and things like that, but relative to what we're doing in medicine and healthcare, you know, it's the safety net and the safe place that plant-based stuff can, can do when it's controlled and it's in the right environment in the right setting. It, it allows us to get the places to what you just so eloquently stated in a way that nothing else can. So I do think that's a big way of the future. Mm-hmm. I do think the the, um, the the energy of lasers and things is a big way of the future because we got to get away from this chemical model. Anytime man attaches something to something so we can patent it and sell it, we tend to get in trouble with it. It tends to cause like look at aspirin, you know, willow bark. Now we put we attach something to it so that we can sell it. And it starts ripping holes in our stomachs and, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So so what? let Mother Nature do its thing. Let energy of different yeah. waveforms do its thing. And that's when you put those two together, I think there's going to be some magic in the future. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. That was fun. I love that. That was fun. <laughs> I, I knew so we were going to go down some fun rabbit holes. but Oh, this, man. I, well, you know, it's been a minute since we caught up. So I know we're, we're doing it rec- while recording, but it's fun. And, you know, we connected on a lot of those levels very early on. And yeah. I think that um, I it was it's refreshing to um, to work with a doctor who's as accomplished and intelligent as you are uh, with um, mature discernment for uh, all of the uh, options and modalities out there that exist. So truly, I, I hope I, I hope that in the future, every doctor uh, orients themselves the way that you do. And it was so much fun to oh, work agree. with you. And um, I'll see you soon. So figure out these lasers. All right, Danica, thank you. I'm very humble. It's truly been an honor to be with you. And I love keep doing what you're doing. Get that prop, you know, get the message out there. Allow people to be free thinkers and keep your health stuff that you're doing. I can't thank you enough for being, you know, such a great ambassador for everything that you have been sharing, you know, both oh, with yourself you. and everything that you stand behind. So oh, uh, love I hope to do it again and we'll see you soon. Well, you know, I mean, I, after my, impl- my explant surgery, I was in your office a couple of days later, like, and you were, you put lasers on me to start healing and everything. So you're all part of the process. So thank you. Yeah. And I look forward, we'll get you going in full speed on your Erconia laser, all your homework stuff. You'll, you'll be lasing your brain every day. Like I do. So I will. I will. All right. Thanks Trevor. Thanks Danica. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.